everyone, and welcome to another episode of Women Empower Active with your sportswear. I'm Amy Moritz, and I'm your moderator um, for the series of interviews that we do with women who we think are just amazing and inspiring and that we love. And, and today we have one who was one of mine that inspires me, and I absolutely love to, to read her, her books um, and her documentary and follow her on Twitter and Facebook. So, uh, Catherine Bertine, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Amy. This is so fun to be able to do this. Thank you. Great. Well, um, we welcome you here, and um, we know you in, in recent years as, as a cyclist and, and an advocate for women's cycling, but your athletic background is, is kind of wide-ranging and far-reaching, so I wondered if you could give us a little bit of, uh, of your athletic history, if you would. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Yeah, I guess I dabbled in a in a bunch of different sports, and they kind of led into this uh, bizarre journey of wherever it is that I am now. So uh, I started out um, as a figure skater growing up. That was my main sport, and I also really enjoyed running. So in high school, it was kind of a balance between skating and and uh, cross country running. And then I kind of had in the back of my mind, I, I knew that. I was a, a good skater. I knew that I wasn't going to be an Olympic medalist, but I thought, okay, how far can I take this? Let me see if I could get to the professional level and maybe skate internationally and you know join some of the shows like uh, you know Holiday on Ice, Disney on Ice, Ice Capades. So uh, I I auditioned for that my senior year of college, uh, high school, and um, I got into the professional skating world. But they said, hey, go to college first. It's you know, we, we like our skaters to, you know, to pursue their education first. So I went to college. In college, I um, transferred from the running sector over into rowing. Uh, I went to school at Colgate University. They had a great rowing program. And so I skated and I rowed for, for my college years. And then right after graduating, I went into the, the skating life uh, full time and uh, toured for a year. Uh, it was a journey that turned out not to be exactly what I thought it would be. You know, um, I was, what, 22, 23, and I was like, wait a minute, how come this isn't exactly what I thought it would be? I thought life was supposed to be like I thought it would be. <laughs> so that was a great lesson to learn that I'm going to be wrong a lot in my life. And I, so I decided to go from skating um, to grad school to pursue my writing dreams. And when I was in grad school, I went to the University of Arizona, so there's not a lot of ice uh, nor water in Arizona. So skating was out, rowing was out, and but I still had that athletic drive. So I got into triathlon because a few of my rowing friends said, hey, you should you should get a bike. Cycling is really the same muscle group as, as skating and rowing, and, and you'd be probably pretty decent on a bike. So I thought, okay. So I got into the triathlon world. Um, ended up spending 10 years there in the tri world and I, I was fortunate enough to turn professional uh, but never you know I definitely not anybody famous and you know uh, wasn't going to be on any Wheaties boxes but I did enjoy that professional realm of uh, triathlon and then I got to this point where I was deciding okay I think it's time to to hang it up and uh, go down the road that society deems necessary, uh, necessary. <laughs> um, so I should be serious now. I should have a career that involves a pantsuit, and I should have, uh, you know, a, a husband and kids and a, and pets. And so, yeah, I should be doing that, right? Because I'm 30 years old. And uh, then I got a, a, an assignment uh, through my journalism career that was going on at the same time. And that was from ESPN saying, you know, we, uh, we'd like you to try to get to the Olympics in two years. <laughs> and by the way, this is a really long answer. Are you, you just totally opened Pandora's box. But oh. <laughs> <laughs> so short story, I went from triathlon to cycling, the end. <laughs> what, was, what was the question? <laughs> Please right into to talking about uh, the, the foray and the, the project that you did with ESPN, which which led to to a book. And, and just before you, uh, I let you answer that question. I want to remind people who are watching that they can tweet in their questions um, using the hashtag #StrongWomen. Um, Ooh, that's exciting. 
So hopefully we'll have some people ask uh, some questions for I mean questions for Catherine. So um, oh. and so you get this assignment from from ESPN, which is hey, let's see if see if you can make an Olympic team, right? In in, in yeah. two years. Tell us about that assignment. So I had been freelancing for ESPN, but it was it was your typical journalism assignments of you know write 500 words here or there on this person or this event. So when they called in 2006 and said, "Hey, we've got an assignment for you," I figured it was your run of the mill regular journalism assignment, and it ended up being something that would completely change my life. Uh, so they said, "We want we've been having a debate a debate here in the offices of ESPN of how." easy or difficult it is to get to the Olympics in this modern day and age. And I knew from just being an athlete, I'm like, well, of course it's difficult, you know, but there are some yahoos out there that just think like, oh, no, it's got to be easy. You, you know, you just hop on a luge and, you know, go wee and collect your medal at the bottom. And they even made that statement. And then the Luge Federation got very, very angry with us. And, you know, and they, but they said, go and see what you can do. And, I, and try to get to the 2008 Beijing Games. And I knew that while I was decent in triathlon, um, my distance was the longer stuff, the half Ironman and the Ironman. So that was not an Olympic event. And uh, I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm okay at cycling. I'm, I'm okay at it, but I only know cycling as a triathlete. I don't know any of the tactics. I just know how to go in a straight line for five hours. And th so I said, all right, I'm going to try to be a road cyclist. And I embarked on this uh, journey to, to see how far I could get in the world of road cycling. And what really changed during that time, at, um, at that point there were about 18 months left, you know, to get to the games. And uh, I fell in love with the sport. I tried a bunch of other sports uh, just to see what some of the quote-unquote fringe sports in America were like, like, um, you know, say fencing or modern pentathlon, and really amazing sports, but um, not anything that I was, I had any talent in whatsoever. So I thought, okay, maybe I can pedal a bike, but I had no idea how difficult and how um, how incredible road cycling would be. So it really gripped my heart, and I wanted to stay in the sport. And um, long, very long story shortened, uh, I did not make the 2008 games. I mean, after 18 months, can you imagine? <laughs> um, I was so devastated. No, I, I thought that was actually a really good thing because I don't think anybody should make it to the games in 18 months. Um, Evelyn Stevens can do that, <laughs> however. She, she's pretty phenomenal. So um, I am not Evelyn. But uh, it was an amazing, an amazing endeavor to try. And then when the assignment ended, uh, Basically, that, that should have been it. should have been like, okay, hang it up. You're done. Um, but I was so in love with the sport that I thought, okay, maybe I can actually, well, you know, cycle my way to the professional ranks of the sport. Because what had happened was I was very strong from triathlon. I was physically strong. But I didn't have the tactics. I didn't have the team, you know, knowledge and understanding. I, I, I had none of that, and I wanted to learn, and I wanted to know. So it became my personal goal after ESPN was out of the picture to say, uh, okay, how far can I take this now? And keep in mind, at that point, then I was uh, 33 and really wanted to, to try to get to the pro level. And um, it, it, some crazy stuff happened. And when I was 36, I got offered my first professional contract uh, in cycling. And so for the past four years, I have been so lucky and fortunate to race professionally in the bike racing world and uh, learn what that's all about. So that's that's the the journey that ESPN led to, you know, to where I am now. You, you mentioned that road cycling just kind of kind of grabbed your heart. You just kind of fell fell in love with it. And, and I know that it's very different from the cycling in triathlon. Um, okay. So, um, uh, yeah, because I can't ride in a pack. I like triathlon because there's no draft. I'm too scared yeah. to ride a somebody. Um, but so what were some of the maybe adjustments that, that you made or some of the things about being a, a road cyclist that you really just said this is, 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 was part of it learning a new sport and having to learn new tactics and, and how all that plays together? Yeah, I think that was, that was the draw. And I think regardless of sport, you know, whatever we're intrigued by in any sport, it usually has to do with, you know, like, how do you advance through the sport? So for cycling, for me, it was like, oh, I, this is an amazing venture because every road race is different, and you have to know how to, you know, how to play certain cards and certain games, and it was just really 
um, baffling and stimulating, and I, I really wanted to learn all of that. But of course, you know, that just takes time. And uh, during the Olympic quest, there wasn't really time. It was like, go, 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 just see what you can do. And then that, that kind of figuring out that enigma of how does this sport work, which is crazy because you, you never really figure it out. Like, it keeps changing, and you keep growing. And, you know, here I am eight years, nine years, nine years later in this sport now, and I'm so utterly shocked all the time by how much I think I know and how much I actually know, and there's, like, this vast chasm between the two. Anyway. For people who might who may not know, there, there are different disciplines within cycling too. And yeah. within, within, is there is there one thing that you are stronger at, or, or find that you're drawn? Yeah. To? Um. For me, time trialing is probably my best skill. Um. Stage racing I like because it's a it's it provides like the longevity and the endurance side, and I really really enjoy the multi day events. Um. Criteriums are not my strength at all. That's the short, fast day of, uh, you know, kind of fast twitch and um, very, very smart racing. <laughs> so that's that that eludes me right there. But I I just love it. I love um, I love the time trial and I love the team dynamics that take place during a stage race because different things are happening on different days and you have to figure out what's going on that day, but also keep an eye on the bigger picture, much like we see in the Tour de France now. You know, there are daily tactics, and then there are overall tactics, and it's really, it's, it's just such a fascinating sport that way. Uh, and so before we get into talking about your, your, document, your documentary and um, the, the changes, uh, slow changes, and some fast changes in women's cycling, uh, let's just talk a little bit specifically about cycling and, and your journey and your, your training. And so what... what how, how do you go about training? What, what's your what's a what's a year like or a training block like for you? Yeah, that's great. It's nice to be asked in that realm of like, what's a year like? Because you know, if you ask me what what a week or a day like is like, that changes all the time, and it's hard to <laughs> it's, it's hard to know. But in um in a year, I mean, basically, I live out in Tucson, Arizona, and uh, you know, the majority of the training has to take place in the morning, very early on, uh, because of the heat. And uh, so my my year is structured where in the winter in the early uh, late late fall winter and early spring is base mile training, and then um, of course utilizing uh, different workouts to work on my on my time trialing or on my um, non-existent sprint. <laughs> these these are are really important tactics that that play into training. Um, and then we pretty much race on the pro scene from, say, February to, for me, through, through mid-October. So it's a really long season. And uh, it's, it's a great season, but, you know, by this time in the summer, it also you have to figure out, like, okay, how do I stay on top of my overall fitness but also not totally burn out? So uh, that's kind of the overview of what a year looks like and what I'm doing now. Uh oh! Looks like we lost somebody, or maybe it's me. Did we lose Amy? Your experience in so many different disciplines has oh, it increased. Interest. Yeah, has it increased your curiosity about the craft as a whole? Oh, absolutely! I think when, um, yeah, I mean that's the thing. I mean, cycling is so multifaceted that you, you know, you can't help but be curious about the whole sport you know, all at once. So even if I focus on a certain area, like the time trial or the road race, I, I'm just fascinated by all the stuff that I'm, I'm also very poor at. <laughs> and so therefore, you know, there's always this impetus to learn and to change and to grow. And I love that about cycling. Like we were saying, every day, every race is different. Mm -hmm. There's never, you know, it's like chess that way. Um, I'm also terrible at chess. <laughs> but it's the whole idea of of that, you know, of, of every game being different, and just when you think you've mastered something, you realize that you still have quite, quite an education to catch up on, so yes, I love it, absolutely love the whole, the whole thing, curious about the sport as it develops and grows, so yep, it's amazing. I actually had another question come in from Kara, um, she wants to know what are some of the differences between men's and women's pro cycling? None. 
Just no difference. <laughs> no, sorry. That will be the shortest answer I ever. <laughs> I need to um, from the standpoint, and I say none, you know, in a, in a positively joking way, in terms of it's just as exciting as the men's race. Watch the women now. I mean, the women are at such a high level of racing that it's uh, it's just really exciting. You know, maybe way back in the day when women were just getting into the sport, you know, maybe collectively as a group of Peloton was slower, but that is not the case in modern times anymore. And it, it's so fast and so developed. So, uh, but but on the technical aspect of that question, what's different today that we're actually trying to, to fix this gap is um, men race uh, more events, uh, they have, um, more TV coverage, they have longer races, um, and really they are just, you know, tradition is kind of on their side, and we're trying to, to make changes saying, hey, we value and respect tradition, but let's bring the women into the sport and highlight them at the same level, because it's just, it's, we use the analogy all the time that women cycling and men cycling, it's kind of like men's and women's tennis, there, there are it's the same game, but there are different finesses, different fine points that you know each, each gender can, um, you know, can showcase. So, so I, I think that, and especially with the physiology of women being suited toward um, uh, endurance, which has been proven time and again in science, you know, we should be watching the women race three weeks at the Tour de France, and physiologically, we absolutely can. Uh, mm -hmm. There's you know, there's absolutely no nothing in science that says that we couldn't do it. In fact, women back in the eighties proved that, that they could. So, you know, we should be evolved at that point. We are seeing women race in Florida, France, and it would be so exciting and really fascinating. Um, so that's what we're working on. That is one of the things that we're um, really trying to, to do in the sport is is showcase uh, the women's incredible endurance and their their capabilities. That just gave me chills. Oh, no, that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, how can how can people support that movement? Uh, well, one very, very easy way in social media is simply um, pay attention to what's going on by being an active participant. So um, share articles, like things, star things, Instagram things, anything that comes up with women cycling. Um, you know, we live in this society where where technology is watching, you know, Big Brother is watching, and things like likes and hits and shares and stars, they actually, there are people that watch the progression of popularity in that way. And when things trend, that's huge. So the more that, that we can do that, the better. And that's where everybody does have an individual power. They can, you know, it, it can be as simple as, you know, like, oh, like, share, send, you know, and you, you can hold a whole sport um, in in the palm of your hand that way if you just realize that you have that power. The other thing too is if uh, if you have TV or if you're you know on a website that is broadcasting a race, um, make sure that you tune in because that'll count as a hit. You know, a viewing oh. a viewing of that of that. And sometimes we have um, we have. Uh, uh, what is it? Sorry, I just saw that Amy, Amy was trying to pop up there. I got distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, um, you know, sometimes we have uh, the greatest things happen just by by one person can can like or share something, and all of a sudden it goes viral. You know, so it, it can really happen. Um, but yeah, TV ratings are huge. So even if you're not going to be home, but you know that there's a bike race on that day, you know, set your DVR, set your recorder, and and, and it still counts as, as a hit, and that's a great thing. Um, and ask for it. Oh, the other thing, I'm really a big proponent of, of asking for what it is that you want in this world. So if you want to see more bike racing, you know, ask websites, ask uh, cable providers, ask local news to cover what it is that you're passionate about, about seeing, whether you're a fan or a racer, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, just we have this amazing ability that I think we so often forget we have, and that is asking the powers that be to make changes because really we are what supports those powers that be. So uh, kind of remembering that and, and going after what we want in that regard, that's something that, that we have the power to do as well. So 
uh, put it out there. You know, ask nicely. <laughs> don't don't be mean. <laughs> don't be rude. <laughs> I've tried both those tactics, and I'm here to tell you that's a, that's not the way to go. So you know, be proactive and and positive, and and uh, but also forceful when necessary too. Um, we have a question. Um, what's the biggest stage race that you've seen? That I've seen. Um, yeah. Let's see. Probably this is in regard to, to women. I'm guessing, so I will answer that accordingly. Um, the Giro d'Italia has, in the past, and I think still currently, I, I believe that race is ten days. I've raced ten day stage races in um, Central America in El Salvador. You know, so <laughs> just kind of like, okay, so El Salvador gets it. Why are we not seeing ten day stage races for women in the US? Like this is. Let's take a cue from the rest of the world, and uh, and there are plenty of other countries that that do that that understand that women can race long distances. So, you know, Italy, El Salvador. Um, we used to have, you know, uh, back in the '80s and in the '50s, we had a Tour de France for for women that ran. Um, it was 18 days at that point. So, like, really amazing feats, you know, that have been out there and uh, we, we just need to bring it back and we need to bring the media on board, you know, to support that. Because once you bring in the media, then you have uh, the sponsorship element that comes in that wants to partner with something where the media is also involved and vice versa. That's that's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. Or this is great. So we're getting questions on Twitter, huh? Yep. Yep. All right. I'm, yeah, we, I'm like to interact with the people listening and those um, watching. You definitely you can tweet at UR Sportswear and hashtag Strong Women. Um, we'll pick you up and we'll get that question on to Catherine. Um, so for our, our next question, for women who may not who may want to get into cycling, what are your suggestions and where should they start? Okay, great. So. Um the first thing you can do if you don't know uh, where to start with women's cycling and you want to get into the sport, find your local bike shop, go to them and say, hey, listen, do you know of any group rides? Do you know of any uh, coaches in the area? Anything that's geared toward beginners wanting to get in the sport. Um, and, you know, in Tucson, we have a pretty thriving cycling uh, community and cycling culture, but I also find that even in the smallest towns, if there is a bike shop, somebody there is knowledgeable about uh, what's going on in the community or can point you in the right direction um, in terms of getting started uh, with a coach, with a group, with training partners, whatever it may be. So that's the best way to do it locally. Go to your local shop. Um, and that's, you know, if, if you can't find answers there, uh, then then send me an email and we'll see what we can do to connect you with, uh, you know, with that are in your area that uh, they can help you out because it really it's a wonderful community it's filled with fantastically quirky people and I mean that in the best possible way and so we'll find you you know find you the right people to connect with if you want to get involved with the sport yeah I love that I love that camaraderie that's awesome it's um, the best yes I would exactly. sport without it you Definitely. You know, if it were filled with mean, nasty people, I'd be gone. I'd be, maybe I'd be curling by now. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> something. You'd be doing something. Something. You'd be doing something. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I think we'll finally end with one of our favorite questions, and that is, like, what words of encouragement do you have for women? who are trying to be active and trying to kind of change their lifestyles? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, and I, I like five, five billion things that come to mind. Um, to shorten that list. I would say, first of all, when you're getting into a sport, you know, never, or not even just when you're getting into it, just never do this. Never compare yourself to anybody else, you know, that's in the sport. There are so many times women will say to me like, I, oh, I want to get involved in the sport, but I'm slow or I'm overweight or I've never done this before. You know, and don't set it up that way. Just say, I just want to see what it's about. Um, and 
you know, have that kind of childlike curiosity of like, oh, what, what might this be like? You know, and that's really, use that to kind of propel you forward and, and try to take all the doubt and, and any sort of negativity. So I'll, I'll keep talking just on that, that, you know, um, don't be afraid of something new. Try to find the excitement about it. Um, and also, uh, you know, the same thing, I could kind of answer the same question for even if you want to try to create change in the world, whatever whatever area of the world you're passionate about, you know, always remember that you truly do have the power. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be rich. You can you can create change simply by being passionate and aligning yourself with the right people who also support your message. Um, that's something that I learned when we were creating the, the Tour de France uh, and pushing for that movement to come back for the women. So. You know, if I'm able to do that, and I am not a world champion, and I'm not an Olympian, um, then truly anybody can do that. It's, it's really about finding the right group. So, you know, just know that, that we, we all have this power, which uh, is really, you know, kind of something we forget. Or maybe it gets pushed down or not celebrated enough as, as we should celebrate that we truly have these, you know, this power to change. Hi, Amy. <laughs> so I, uh, Jacqueline stepped in for me, so I, so I missed some uh, some questions here. Um, but uh, you know, I know you were talking a little bit about La Course, um, you know, and 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 that and and that movement. Um, was there anything, and you may have already answered this, but what surprised you about about all of that? And and did you get support from places that maybe you weren't expecting? Yeah, you know, and we really didn't talk specifically about La Course. And just for, for our viewers that are out there, uh, La Course is the one-day race that we have now at the Tour de France, which is supported by ASO and the Tour de France. Um, and that's a big deal, because back in 1989, uh, the Tour de France and the race directors, ASO, revoked uh, that name from allowing any women to race under their name. The Tour de France. Um, so it was really a huge thing to be able to to get this day, and believe me, we are working very hard to make sure that we can secure you know a stage race first, maybe a week, and then two weeks and three weeks as the infrastructure of the of the sport can support that for the women's side. Um, so that's one thing that I always like to put out there is though even if we have quote unquote just one day now, it's actually um, it, it's something that is our foot in the door. And it's really an amazing accomplishment that we have that and that the world is seeing and celebrating it, because that's really what we need to have happen, and, and that is happening. Um, but yeah, what surprised me about that? Well, first of all, <laughs> I think uh, I could speak collectively for both uh, Mariana Vos, Emma Pooley, Chrissy Wellington, and myself. The four of us, one of the things that baffled us the most was even though we had like a full-on business plan, a manifesto, a website, and we still have all of this, you know, explaining why it is that women should be able to race the Tour de France. We still had people that were like, what? I don't understand. Like, you want to race against the men, like in the men's field? And we're like, no, 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 no. We want to have it structured like, say, a marathon, where the men are there and the women are there, but no, you're not racing against each other, or there's a staggered start to the field, you know. And people couldn't, there were some people out there that couldn't grasp that. They could not envision uh, a peloton of women racing, and that was that kind of blew our minds. We're like, wow, we got <laughs> we got to really go back to step one on this. Um, and then, of course, we we anticipated this, and but it still shocks me nonetheless. The pushback that we would get in you know modern day and age of people being like, well, no, you know, women couldn't possibly do that. No, like they couldn't possibly do it. Like they could, their minds couldn't even grasp possibility of, um, I don't know, evolution, science, progress, like, so, um, and I guess there's one other thing that, that did floor us, um, we, I, I mean, this is, you know, we have such support, we had, obviously, we had close to 100,000 people sign the petition, uh, we had just everything kind of snowballed in a very positive way once the movement got underway. Uh, but there were times that surprised us that, um, where we would receive, um, I wouldn't say negativity, but we would receive pushback a little bit from uh, from women in the sport, and even women outside the sport, just saying, "Well, I I don't know if if you know we should be doing this," and that even today, even I still will sometimes get uh, 
women who say, hey, you know what, we, even at a local level, like a local racing level, people say, well, I, I don't know, I mean, I don't know if we deserve the same prize money, because the men's race is a little bit longer, and maybe they have more people, so they should have more prize money, and they should have more attention. And I'm just sitting there like, oh, man, you know, <laughs> uh, we really have to kind of deconstruct the sport a little bit to show that that, you know, we absolutely deserve the same opportunities. You know, you wouldn't say that in any other realm or in any other line of work, so why would we say that in, in professional sports, too? Um, so that that's a battle, an ongoing battle, and I get very vocal about that, as you've just noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and now I've noticed just anecdotally um, on, on Twitter, it seems like there are more races, at least in the U.S., that are adding women's fields or women's races uh, to already existing races. Yes, which is fantastic. That was kind of the snowball effect we were hoping for from being, you know, the high-profile Tour de France. That's another reason we wanted that race to kind of break the ice and say that's where people are seeing, that's where all the eyeballs are going. So if people are paying attention to what's happening at the Tour de France, then it should snowball to the other um, sectors of racing. You know, I don't want to say lower level, because it's all the same women, the same talent, but uh, smaller races that aren't seen as often. And sure enough, so, you know, um, for California uh, had, was it three days or four days this year? Uh, uh, U.S. Pro Challenge has three days. This is great. Um, and But this there's also, there's kind of a, a danger zone here because it is absolutely 100% fantastic that these races are saying, hey, let's acknowledge the women and let's give them some days. Now what needs to happen is they need to give us the rest of the days <laughs> because there's no reason that we should be racing three or four days at the Tour of California when the men are racing 10, right? We can race 10 too. We can race 11 and more. So we, you know, we should have that, the people who, who came out in these past this past year and gave us those starting days, they now need to up the game and say, all right, that was such a great success, let's make it longer. Uh, let's bring the women, I, I fully believe that the, the women's pro peloton can actually save the sport, so to speak, uh, on both sides because we're bringing something new, something exciting, something not, you know, riddled with scandal. So, you know, why aren't we getting those 10 days? That's something that we should be pushing for. And that that's a danger zone. Sometimes women will feel like, okay, we should be grateful for what we've gotten, for what we've been given. And mm -hmm. if we sit there saying, hey, more, 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 demand, demand, then uh, maybe we'll be looked at negatively or poorly or um, greedy. And unfortunately, this is just, uh, this is this is what's been ingrained, I think, in, too often in our culture, um, but I think that we should be absolutely asking for for equal. It makes complete sense. Uh, it's just sometimes I guess that message get lo gets lost in a little bit of the progress, and so I try to very gently say, no, it's wonderful. Always praise the advancements and the the gift that we've been given in terms of having our presence at races. But now at the same time, push the envelope and say, well, let's talk about those six days that are missing. You know. And with a smile, you know. Uh, so that's one way to, to do it. And we, we all really need to do it because if it's just me, they're just like, oh, my God, would you shut her up, please? You know, <laughs> we need to make sure that everybody's out there talking so it's not just, uh, not just uh, <laughs> one person babbling. <laughs> Yeah, and, and is it also a case, you know, I, I've heard people say, well, a, a woman could never race in the Tour de France as, as it's structured now, uh, but is it also that given that opportunity, you know, that women have never had that, that chance, and they're not, you know, maybe, you know, that, that the opportunity then creates an environment for women to train and race and, 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 and become better, and not, like you said, not race against the men, but be able to race the same the same course, the same number of days. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, and, and I mentioned this earlier, but physiologically, women actually have a gender advantage in terms of distance. Um, we explored this topic in our film, Half the Road, and in endurance running, for example, the longer a race gets, the narrower the gap between the men's and women's finishing time, which goes to show very similar. We're also trying to prove this, and, and I've been working with, uh, with a wonderful um, statistician in, in looking at the data, and we can prove it on, on the cycling side too, that the longer the, uh, the event, the, the gaps in time narrow. So 
it, it's absolutely, of course we can do this. Um, it's just easier for people to dismiss it and say, oh, women can never do that because they haven't seen it yet. So we are very much trying to say, no, you, you know, we can do it. Give us the chance. And sure enough, there are races that do get it, and they have men's and, race, men's and women racing roughly the same event, the same distance. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's executed flawlessly and wonderfully. And, you know, if women are a couple miles per hour slower than the men's average, you don't know it. You don't see it. You know, it, it, it's not something you can you can actually see in the moving speed, and um, so these theories kind of go out the window that we can't do it. Angela, when you when you said that, it, it reminds me of watching the, the the Tour de France right now and seeing um, the I'm listening to some of the the commentators, and then they're like, well, this isn't a coffee shop ride because they're they're putting into perspective how fast they're they're riding. So even when you see the how fast the men are going, it's 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 that perspective. It's, it's you don't always have that perspective when you're watching it from your couch. Exactly, exactly, and that's I mean that's all of the sport too. You know, it, it's it's hard to get that perspective. So if you can ever go out to a race, definitely I so encourage you to go watch the sport. And even better, watch it with, if you're new to the sport, watch it with somebody who knows cycling and they can kind of explain the intricacies because that's when people really get hooked. Most people think, you know, oh, it's just who can get to the, the top of the hill fastest or who can get, you know, to the, the finish line fastest. But there's so much going on in the sport that people um, who are new to the sport don't realize. And as soon as they learn that all of these other tactics are going on, they're totally mesmerized and then we gain new fans. So... That is, uh, you know, that's something to, to always do. And if you know the sport, then take it upon yourself to maybe educate people who, uh, who are new to it or who you think would enjoy it, but they don't know it yet. That's, you know, that's something you can do too. We had a question come in from uh, Twitter, um, and it says, "Have you seen the article about self self deprecation and women cyclists? And if you had any thoughts on it?" And I'm I'm not sure what article they're referring to, and I don't know if you've seen it. And I. Yeah, I feel like this was maybe out a few months ago. I, I did. I know that I read this, and and if I'm, I, I try to read as much as I can when these these great articles come through. And I I did read that, and I just remember that it did ring true in the sense that we like we we too often say things like like I was saying before. Oh, we're I'm too slow, or I'm too overweight, or I'm too this, or I'm too that, or, or we don't take our, we don't own our victories, or our, you know, we always kind of struggle with that line between, um, you know, self-deprecation, which is a great thing, but if we're also trying to push the sport forward and really make advances for, you know, for something, we need to also own and be proud of what we achieve and what we accomplish, not just as in racing, but, um, you know, in everyday life, <laughs> you know, it, when when women do something that is is good, you know, we we should be celebrating it, and not not just ourselves, but you know, the more we can celebrate our fellow women, uh, that is something that we need to be more comfortable with as a society, and uh, it's it's really a beautiful thing when women support other women, and so this whole self-deprecation, you know, it's it great when it's used as a small marker of humility and being humble, but in, a, in an overall big picture, like, if I kind of sat back and said, oh, yeah, it would be great if the women could race the Tour de France. I don't know if I could do it. No. you got to cut that out. you just got to be like, of course we can do it. We should be doing it. We need a Tour de France, and we're not going to stop till we get one. You know, that's the side that we have to put forward and, and own it. So, um, that's, you know, self-deprecation has its place, but it, it, we need to move past that and be, be stronger, too. You know, you know, and you mentioned celebrating other women's, you know, victories also. Um, and uh, before I ask that, you just took a sip, and someone wanted to know if you were drinking wine tonight. That's water. <laughs> <laughs> just to clear it up for anybody out there who wants to know. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm incredibly boring. Um, see, okay. <laughs> Self-deprecation, <laughs> right there, which is sometimes true, and sometimes I'm not boring. But there's just water in here, so I will let you judge. <laughs> um, you know, as and, and especially with with um, you know the the course coming up um, upon us soon, um, yeah. and even in general, are there um, teams or women cyclists that 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 were new to following women cycling, maybe that. That we, that we should be on the lookout for or, or follow? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's 
I, of course, love every women's team that's out there, uh, my own especially, but, you know, all of them. Um, this is what's fun, is that our sport is no different than any other team sport, and you can find out the personalities of these women. You can, you know, have a favorite because maybe it's a regionally based team, or maybe you know a rider that lives nearby, you know. There are so many ways to kind of figure out who it is that you want to root for and cheer for. Um, and as the women get more comfortable with being vocal and being, uh, you know, letting their personalities kind of shine and uh, putting themselves out there in social media, you know, it, it's, it does a great thing for our sport. Um, I don't know where this particular question came in from. I don't know if it came in from the States or somewhere else, but, you know, the U.S. has... Uh, was it five or six UCI-based teams this year, which is at very high level of racing. Uh, we've got so many regional teams. And um, then, of course, you know, there are national champions of every country. Uh, there are Olympic and world champions. So it's kind of, it, it, there are so many people to cheer and to root for. Um, I think one of the most special things, too, is how all of us, we're all in the same boat. So even though we all want to kind of, rip each other's legs off in the heat of competition, there, we truly have a camaraderie uh, amongst us for moving the sport forward and for representing our sport. So it's kind of, that's one of the things I love is that you can, you can find somebody to cheer for in this sport, but you can also find so many people to cheer for all at once because we're all kind of, kind of pushing for the same change and fighting for the same thing. So that was a really long-winded way of saying like there are so many teams out there and if they, if they write back, um, you know, specifically, who should I root for? Well, then I'd say BMW, happy to, because <laughs> they signed me. Give a little plug to your team, your sponsor there, right? We say that, sorry, say that again, Amy. I said give a little plug to your team and your sponsor. Yeah, definitely. So this year I am racing for BMW, happy Tooth dental, uh, and I got signed in, in late May, and uh, so I started the season without a team. And this wonderful team let me guest ride for them, and then they took me on after the Tour of the Gila race. So it's really nice to, to have a home and to, to feel part of a, of a team. I've, there have been a few times where I've started a year without a team, and it's hard. It's really hard. You wonder, like, you know, am I doing this all for myself? Am I getting anywhere? And now I'm going backward, you know. So I, I'm so happy to be on this team. And... Uh, you know, so yeah, if you're looking for someone to root for, I'll say mine, but I will say there are so many great teams. We've got uh, um, Team 2016, we have Tibco, we have Pepper Palace, we have Blasio Shram. Um, who am I leaving out that's going to be like, hey, how come you didn't say us? I'm thinking of our U.S. based teams. Um, so, you know, there, there are so many. There are many. Oh, Optum. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of friends on, on all these teams, and I'm, I'm very grateful to know so many amazing women. So, um, yeah, I mean, Google women's pro cycling and check out all the teams that, that come up, and you, you, you'll be amazed. <laughs> well, one thing, and I, I don't want to ask you this question to put you on the spot, but one thing I always am, am curious about, um, especially in watching the, the Tour de France and some of my favorite men's riders, are, are, there, are there male cyclists or male teams that have been very supportive? Yes. yes I know they have been, but are there some, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, when we made the film, when we made Half the Road, uh, mm -hmm. I did a crowdfunding campaign to, to make that film happen, and so I relied heavily on the support of, of uh, you know, the fans. Um, and... I had there were a bunch of male pro cyclists that that donated to the film and just kind of said, "Hey, this is my way of saying like we're behind you all the way." You know, Bill Gaiman, um, Brent Bookwalter. You know, there there are more, and I'm doing that thing again where I'll name like two people and then be a horrible <laughs> person for forgetting some others. But uh, you know, there I've I have always encountered nothing but positive vibes and really, you know, and verbal well wishes from the men's cycling side. Um, I think they, the majority of them know the fight that we're up against. Some of them don't. Some of them might not realize at all, you know, um, how, how much work we have to do on the women's side. But the majority of the guys realize it and, uh, and they're vocal about it, and, you know, if we, if we ask them to be. Um, so, yes, uh, I think that most of our struggle has been more on the administrative side. You know, the people that are in power that aren't out there uh, 
watching the sport progress, you know, from within the peloton. So that's where we've run into tr trouble. But you know, I, I train with uh, with men in Tucson, and they've been amazing and supportive, and they've made me a better cyclist too, as well as a better person. So uh, the guys in this sport are incredible, and I care deeply about the sport on their side and on the women's side, and. Um, you know, in no way would ever want to uh, to vilify the guys because they've, they've been real staunch supporters of us as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is your schedule now like for your your now your happy home for a team? And what's your, what's your race schedule? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, to break it down for people who don't know the sport, usually teams are uh, consistent of say on the women's side a roster of maybe ten to twelve people. So, um, and at races, you usually only have six on a roster at races. So I, I don't go everywhere where the team goes, and nor does anybody else on the team. It, it mixes around depending on the type of race. So we're actually kind of awaiting our August schedule right now. I'm hopefully, I hope to be at the U.S. Pro Challenge in Colorado. Um, I hope to be, uh, you know, earn myself a spot on the team um, for our team time trial at World Championships. I will personally race uh, World Championships in Richmond this September for um, St. Kitts and Nevis, which is the country I represent through dual citizenship. That's a whole other hour, so I'm just going to say that. And then, um, and then, buy her book and read the book. It's all in the book. Here's a book about that. Um, <laughs> and then I'll do the. My season will end in Barbados at the Caribbean Championships in October. So. I've still got a little bit of racing left, um, and then as I'm here in New York visiting family, I'm going to do tour of the Catskills in a couple or in a week and a half, I think it is. So I'm looking forward to that. So that's uh, that's kind of my my outlook. But then again, you never know. You could fall on your face, and then it's you're done for two months. So I've done that too. <laughs> there are pictures on uh, on Twitter and Facebook to uh, to, to prove that. To yeah. Um, so, so as we, your elbow, yeah, that's there. You go. There, it was quite a crater, right? It was. Yeah. It's better now. Do you see that? <laughs> I don't know. It's better now. It's all in one piece. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what? Um, so as you you're waiting for for your race schedule, how do you? Go, what's your training schedule set up like then for for you? Are you you know how do you go about that? Yeah, so this this month, it, that's always a tricky thing when you don't know exactly what your next schedule of races is. You know, um, how do you how do you work that schedule? I've had really great coaches in my career. This year, I decided to try a new tactic, which was or is uh, employing the advice that I've taken from my various coaches over the past few years, utilizing that. Um, in a way that where I also seek mentorship from other female riders that have been in the sport, say, hey, you know, would you mind telling me what what has worked for you, what hasn't worked? So I, I kind of now have this mix of, of past coaching, uh, present day advice, and then I finally thought, like, you know what, I've been in the sport for nine years, and I think I've learned some things. I'd like to put that into play and see if, if I utilize um, certain intervals or certain blocks of training or certain weeks. Like, could I actually trust myself to build a program that would yield some results? Um, and so the good news is I've actually had my best season now at 40, uh, you know, trying to trust my instincts and utilize the what I think is the right advice. Um, you know, and then, of course, the, the downside to that is that I'm not a world champion, but, <laughs> but you know, I'm my, my own personal uh, world champion. I've gotten a little bit better and a little bit stronger. So that's it's kind of been an experimental year, and I've been really happy with uh, the you know the results to date, except when I crash on my elbow. <laughs> I didn't write that one so well. <laughs> you froze. Either you that, froze or somebody's got to say something. That, that does. Are you? Still here? Did we lose? Are you there? Can you, can, you, can you see me now? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, you got me now. All right, well, good because we've got one last we've got one last question. And um, thank you so much. We want to thank you so much for for your time and your patience with our technical difficulties today too. But but my, the, the last thing we want to know is what words of encouragement would you or empowerment would you have? 
for women who are you know who are watching this? Ah, uh, alas. So Jacqueline actually asked me this when you were when you were off air, um, when you went on vacation. <laughs> and, uh, just to to give a very short recap, I was just saying you know never compare yourself to anybody else. Get in the game, try something new because it's fun to try things that are new, and I think we lose that vibe as adults especially. So you know. Just go do something for for the love of of enjoying something new. Um, and then the other thing I said was, you know, don't be afraid to to uh, try to change whatever it is about this world that you feel needs changing, um, and know that you have the power to make that happen. Because if, if I was able to make any change happen, and I, you know, I'm not famous or or wealthy or you know in the public eye, if I could make some change happen, um, then anybody can absolutely do that. And I would really love to drive that point home so that we can all kind of know that we have that power. Great. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for your time, and I thank everybody for, uh, for joining us on, on this edition of Women in Power Active, and stay tuned for, uh, for our next interview coming up hopefully next month. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, Amy.